While I mostly consider myself a weird slash lost media YouTuber, I have dabbled in a couple of true crime related topics in these past three years on YouTube. From historical war crimes to disturbing pieces of lost media related to actual deaths, accidents, and murders. It's safe to say I've spent a lot of time on the darker side of the internet and reality, looking for and documenting anything I find fascinating or that I feel needs more attention and awareness. However, no topic has truly saddened me as much as tonight's case. Fair warning that tonight's video is not for the faint of heart and will contain mentions of deformities, abuse, and murder. Welcome back to another episode of Yoshimi. Tonight, we will be discussing the case of Andy the Goose and how his murder has gone unsolved for over three decades. Andy was born in Harvard, Nebraska on a farm sometime in 1987. Andy was a special goose as he was not born with any feet. However, this would all change in 1989 when Andy was two years old. He would meet the man that would change his life forever. The man was named Gene Fleming. Gene was a man of many talents and high status, an inventor and tinkerer. Gene had made his fortune in manufacturing and had turned the ammunition depot that the rest of the Fleming family had been living at into apartments complete with its own rec room and chicken hutches. Gene's granddaughter, Jessica Fleming, recalls that fateful day Jean had first arrived with Andy. I got home after a brutal day of junior high, she says. I looked out the window and I could see my grandpa holding a leash, so I walked out to see what he was up to, because he was always up to something. As it turned out, prior to the days leading up to Andy's arrival into the life of the Flemings, Jean had visited his sister-in-law's farm a few days prior and was moved by Andy's plight. So he decided to take the goose and his mate Polly under his care in order to further help the disabled bird. As Gene was an inventor, he got to work on something that could assist the bird in moving from one area to another without a struggle. First, Gene had tried using a skateboard the size of the goose, figuring it could push the board with one stump and balance with the other one. However, this turned out to be a failure as it was not optimal for Andy. Despite this setback, Gene eventually hit the jackpot solution, a pair of leather baby shoes stuffed with foam rubber. By the time Jessica had gotten home from school, Andy was running around the yard, tugging at the other end of the leash that Jean had brought Andy home with. With this new lease on life, Andy saw international stardom. One of Jean's friends, Gary Johansson, had worked for the Hastings Tribune, and after writing up a piece on Andy, the goose's story went viral. Almost overnight, everyone wanted to know more about this goose and the man who helped him walk again. Countless newspapers and magazines were reaching out to do stories, Reader's Digest had a profile done on Andy, People Magazine conducted a whole photo shoot for the goose and his owner, and they even appeared as a guest on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. Nike had also gotten word of the goose, and after finding out he preferred their brand of baby shoes, had sent Andy a crate of some of their most stylish designs, as well as a lifetime supply of baby shoes for him. With this, Andy's fame only continued to rise. As he was now the talk of the town, Gene and Andy had begun to tour around in Gene's orange Triumph TR7. Andy would make appearances at libraries, schools, parades, county fairs, and Gene and Andy even spoke at disability awareness events. Tourists had come from all over to see the Nike wearing goose, and Gene had even created the Andy Fan Club. When asked about the origin of deciding to help the disabled goose, Gene Fleming told People Magazine, Because I'm a Shriner, my natural instinct was to help him. Gene's daughter, Jessica Fleming, stated that Andy was very sweet-natured and that he was literally just a nice bird. However, despite the growing fame and popularity of the goose and his owner, this would tragically come to an end. On October 19th, 1991, Andy had disappeared. Eventually, Gene and his wife Nadine Fleming had gotten a phone call asking if Andy was okay. As it turns out, a couple of Hastings residents were out metal detecting at a local park when they discovered the body of a goose with its head and wings removed, bearing the same sneakers that Andy had worn. The Flemings then rushed to the hutch where Andy and his mate Polly had resided, only to find fresh footprints in the dirt and Andy and Polly nowhere to be found. Andy's murder made national news, a community who rallied together to celebrate and admire a footless goose, only for him to be murdered at the height of his fame and popularity. Reporters from all over conducted stories on Andy's brutal slaying, going into graphic details about how he was found and his cause of death. 
While to most of the world this seemed like a flash in the pan sensational news story about someone's pet dying, the people of Hastings still wanted answers as to who would commit such an atrocity of animal cruelty to their beloved star. The Chamber of Commerce had set up a reward fund to anyone who could provide information that would lead to an arrest on Andy's killer. The original reward was $100, but it had eventually been raised to $10,000. By 1993, the case for Andy was still open, the killer was still out there, and the town was still feeling the shock of the senseless murder. By this time as well, the case had also begun to fall to the wayside with very few leads being made. The most popular was that Andy was killed as a part of some satanic or ritualistic animal sacrifice, though nothing came from this disturbing claim. The murder had, of course, struck Gene the most out of anyone. He had buried Andy quietly in his own backyard, which had been the site of their first walk together. While Gene had requested a bronze memorial for Andy, one was never created. Though a local granite company had donated a large headstone for Andy's burial site, which stands at the Fleming's homestead to this day. Shortly after, Gene Fleming had begun exhibiting signs of Alzheimer's after Andy's death. Gene Fleming passed away in 2000 in a nursing home in Grand Island, Nebraska, never getting closure of what happened to his best friend friend. With the lack of any leads or hard evidence, the trail of who killed Andy the Goose eventually went cold. Despite this, Andy's case was somewhat reopened in the 2010s by none other than Jessica Fleming, now Jessica Corgi. Jessica had begun going through old documents regarding Andy, crime scene photos, fan mail, notebooks, etc., looking to dig up or find anything that could have been missed in the previous years since the murder. When Jessica started to contact key figures in the case, it was then that she noticed some interesting inconsistencies about the case, still believed to be unsolved. However, a call to the Chamber of Commerce around the time Jessica was investigating the case had then President Don Reynolds confirmed that, about two years after the murder, someone from the Sheriff's Department called and said, well, we found out who did it, but we can't tell you and we don't want to have any news release about it. He said over the phone yesterday, we didn't know what to do. Finally, we donated the reward to our community foundation, which used it for kids' projects. The Sheriff's Department had told Reynolds that the killer was someone who was not responsible mainly suggesting that the person who killed Andy was indeed found but was believed to be mentally disabled and not in control of their own actions, leading to the closest thing to closure anybody has ever seen in over 30 years since Andy's untimely death. Despite having never heard of Andy's story prior to writing this video, his story had moved me in a way like no other video topic really has. Andy's life was celebrated, not just as an animal who is given a new lease on life, but as a role model to people, mainly children living with disabilities. Andy and Jean attended so many events not for the fame, but for the chance to be able to speak out and raise awareness for people who have similar ailments and conditions in their lives. Andy's death was untimely, unjust, and brutal. While it is unclear what Andy would have wanted, I do not believe he would want for someone who is disabled to be punished and scrutinized for actions they cannot control, even if it led to his death. Andy was a great animal, friend, and public figure to everyone he was around, and the Flemings, including Jean and Jessica, did and have continued to do their best to make sure that Andy's memory is kept alive. A documentary about Andy's life is currently in the works by Jessica Corgi, and I will link to where you can support the project down in the description below. With that being said, this has been Yoshimi, and have a good night.